Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Hello, friend, and welcome back to the conversation. This episode has been uh, long in coming. Not that long, but I had promised it to happen like three or four episodes ago. But I decided to insert three episodes on manifesting in between. This is part of a series on mastering your emotions. It started with episode 110, which is entitled Mastering Your Emotions. Well, there are two episodes on that, and then I did another one on uncovering your shadow beliefs, which was episode, let's see, 112. And this is the long-awaited 114, which is now 116. (laughs) Hope you got all that straight. So if you really want to get the full value out of this, go back to episode 110 and start there, if you haven't already done so. And this episode is about handling those shadow beliefs. Those beliefs that I'm not good enough, I don't matter, I don't deserve, or the whole, I'm not worthy. And just to recap, I call shadow beliefs those beliefs that are in the shadows, those aspects or basic ideas that we have about ourself, ourself that are tied directly to our self-concept, who we are as a person. You could consider it a core belief. And I refer to it as a shadow belief because It's one of those beliefs that we have, but we've disowned it. We've dissociated from it. We have pushed it into the shadows. And most often we pretend, we go throughout our day, we go throughout our life, we pretend it isn't really there. And through an event, through an argument, through an interchange with another person, we are left with a less than amazing feeling, downright unpleasant, anger, disappointment, embarrassment, shame, Anger and frustration is usually at the forefront of it. And we have the feeling as if somebody pushed our button and we went from zero to 100 just like that. Zero to 100 in intensity. And most often our response doesn't really fit the circumstance. Yet when we dig underneath, when we dig down below, when we look in the shadows, our interpretation is that because of their action, because of what they said, they are validating that I'm not enough, or I don't matter. But remember, it's a perception. They just said what they said. Without that belief underneath it, it's just another thing someone says, and it really means nothing. We can actually look at them and saying they're having some kind of response, like what's going on with you? But we don't do that. We have these underlying shadow beliefs that we use to perceive the world Asking the question, what does this mean about me in relationship to you, relationship to all that is? And until we deal with these shadow beliefs, it's going to influence our responses, influence our behaviors day in, day out, even in the subtlest ways. And going back to uncovering the shadow beliefs in that episode, I did talk about a a number of different symptoms of how it shows up, even in positive ways, seemingly positive ways. One of those being a killer work ethic. Well, you are you will work and work and work, outwork anybody else, and seemingly to achieve, but underneath it is to prove that I'm enough. And unfortunately, when you have this belief, there's almost the idea that's in the back of your mind, you can never work too hard. You can never work enough. Like, it's never, ever enough, no matter what the outcome. I think I referred to a client in the past uh, one year they had a like $275,000. I'm going to get the figures mixed up just a little bit, but you'll get the general idea. So let's start out year one. Year one, they made like some $80,000 in revenue. The following year, they made about $275,000 in revenue. The third year, they pulled out all the stops and they really upgraded their marketing efforts. And they ended up at the end of their fiscal year at about $970,000 in revenue. Now, most people would be popping the cork on the champagne, celebrating all night and all week, possibly for the next six months. But it was almost a month later, and they were saying we could have done better. So what would be the experience if you're focusing on all the events that took place over the last year, saying, if only we had done this, if only we did that, we could have, should have made 
over a million dollars. See, the focus was no longer on what they did. They were focusing on how they fell short. And that became the driving force for their company. You see, perfection does not exist in nature. It just doesn't exist anywhere. It's dependent upon the criteria that you use at any given moment. Did you meet the gate? Did you meet the metrics? Did you meet the criteria? Can you check all the boxes? If yes, then that effort was near perfect. Or you could say it was perfection. But if the ongoing idea, and if you have a belief that I'm a perfectionist, you have to understand underneath it is that shadow belief, I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. So you have to prove it. You have to have this idea that you are a perfectionist in order to overcome this shadow belief. Now, I think I'm going to take a moment and talk about what is a belief in general. Well, there is no such thing as a belief, meaning that you can't pull it around in a wagon, you can't point to it on the floor, or pull it out of your pocket. You can't lean in and whisper in your friend's ear and say, Hey, you want to see my belief? It's a real beauty. Let me go get it. No, a belief is a concept of mind. It's an idea that we feel fairly certain. There's a degree of certainty that it's true. It doesn't mean that it is true, but we feel fairly certain that it is true. It's a personal thing. Now, beliefs typically start out as a hypothesis. It's an idea. You know, it's not hard and true, but over time, we tend to collect evidence for it. For instance, let's say that when you were four or five, you wanted to prove to your mom what a good boy or girl you were, and you cleaned your room. You go running to her and says, Mommy, Mommy, I cleaned my room. And she says, Let's go look. And then she opens up the door, and you can see the look of discontent on her face. You were expecting to see this like, oh, wow, look at this. No, it was a look of discontent. And she says, I thought you said you cleaned your room. Your bed isn't made. Your toys are out over there. Your clothes are on the floor. I don't see where you cleaned your room at all. And suddenly, this feeling of elation, this feeling of pride turns into disappointment. You disappointed your mom. You're not enough. Now, at this point, it's just an idea. You don't really have the words for it. But the experience was that you missed the mark. You didn't come through. You didn't please the other person. They didn't validate it. And like I said, at this point, it's a mere hypothesis. It's just a possibility. Maybe you're not enough. And then, oh my God, next week, something else happens and you fall short. You miss the mark. You're not pleasing and you're left with a feeling, I'm not enough. So let me ask you a question. How many events would have to occur before you came to the realization or the general conception that you're not enough? Now, this is an interesting aspect of the brain. It typically takes about three to five times for you to be convinced of something. Now, that's a general rule because some people are never convinced and other people are easily convinced. But as a general rule, as a human being, if you have three examples that prove a point, you now have a degree of certainty. A belief is born. Again, it's not the truth. Beliefs are not the truth. It's just something we've adopted, an idea, a meaning about life that we feel fairly certain is true. It's a story. So far, it could be said that this story that I'm not good enough is context specific, meaning that it may just be your parents who don't think you're enough or your mom doesn't think you're enough. But then maybe you go to school and you study hard or you thought you did well on a, on a test and you get the grade back and it's less than perfect. Maybe you got five wrong. Oh my God, I'm not good enough. And then as typically happens in your teens, you get interested in having a relationship of someone from the opposite sex or even the same sex. I don't know. But you, you're interested in a relationship if you're interested in other people, even in just having friends. And you approach them and they rebuff you. They're not interested. Oh my God, maybe it's true. I'm not enough. It's just another layer of certainty, another point that proves the idea that I'm not enough. Now, this is where the concept of the confirmation bias kicks in, and I've talked about that in a previous episode, and basically what that says, if I'll sum it up again, is that once you're convinced of something, once you believe something is true, 
then your mind will go out and seek evidence to confirm your belief, confirm your perception of reality. Because, you know, your operating system isn't going to go out and look for contrary evidence to maybe you have it all wrong. No, it looks for evidence to confirm your current conception of reality. And this is also where your reticular activating system kicks in and you start to notice every occurrence, every situation which proves or, or points to or infers that I'm not enough. And for more about your reticular activating system, you can go back to the podcast episode called uh, Your Internal GPS. And I'll leave a link in the show notes to that one. But that concept is basically you've programmed your mind that certain things are important, certain aspects are true about reality, and then your brain, your mind goes out and searches for evidence. It, it notices those occurrences more readily than all the other evidence out there. And that is why you can have an event, you can have an experience with another person that causes anger, causes hurt feelings in you. It wasn't really the event, but you perceived it in a way where it made you feel less than amazing, made you feel uncomfortable. They were uncomfortable, unpleasant feelings because you made it mean that you weren't enough, you didn't matter, or something like that. Now, in episode 112, I did reference a story that I thought I had told in one of the other episodes, and I looked back over the last 100 episodes or so, and I couldn't find it. So I'm going to retell the story here because it really is a good uh, example of adopting a belief at an early age and how it plays through the rest of your life. So here's the story. About 15, 20 years ago, I was dating a woman who's not my wife now, but it was a different woman, and she made it known to me that she was going to go out to the bar with her friends, her female friends. It was a girl's night out. But the way it was pitched, the tone of voice was like, you're not invited, we don't want you there, and like we're going to have fun. And I got angry. Like One, I don't like people telling me what to do, and I, I have to look at why that is, but... Uh, the anger that was there, immediately I was angry. but And she started defending why I wasn't invited and what she was going to do and the whole purpose of it. But I kind of tuned it out. Like she was talking in front of me. But in this particular moment, I had a, a moment of self-reflection. I looked inside and I asked myself, well, what's really going on here? What am I angry about? And the anger was just covering up fear fear that she was going to go out and potentially find somebody else, hook up with somebody else. And I asked the question, which I asked you to ask in the uncovering your shadow beliefs, what does that mean about me? If it did happen, let's say she did go out and she found someone new. What would that mean about me? Well, in this moment of self-reflection, I realized, and all this is happening like really quick in my head, I realized if it was true, and she found somebody new that I would make that mean that I'm not lovable. I'm not enough. I'm disposable. And it confirmed the fact that I could love you, but I can't trust you. Sooner or later, you will betray my love. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know that was there. Was that present in the relationship before that one? And I looked and I looked back through my memories. And yes, that generalized feeling was there. I was seeking to be validated which never came. And in that relationship, I took it to mean that I was not lovable enough. I wasn't good enough. And then I wondered, was it in the relationship before that one? And it was. In some way, some theme, that theme or that idea was running through the tapestry of all my relationships, all the way back to my teen years. And it was there I found the ending of my first big relationship, the one that I was really invested in, the one that I was totally, my heart was right there, and she ended it. She didn't want to be together anymore. She didn't want me in her life anymore. I was left feeling from that, it's true, I'm not enough. And that, I didn't say those words, but that's definitely how I felt. And then I wondered, did it occur any earlier than that? And I traced it back to when I was eight years old. I was in the third grade. Okay, I'm taking a break here. I'm splitting this episode up into two halves, part one and part two. So you can pick up the rest of the story in episode 117. 
So until next time, this is your host and friend, Daniel Danovi, urging you to follow your bliss, live your life from inner signals as you engage in the epic adventure. (laughs) 